All right, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Steve Steele. I am a foregut surgeon down in Orlando, Florida, and I'm part of the Clinical Practice Committee at the American Foregut Society. And for those that have been following along, we've been doing webinars throughout the year on some foregut topics to include some prime speakers in the world of gastroenterology and surgery focused around uh, foregut disease. Tonight, our topic is going to be the therapeutic approaches to the treatment of gastroparesis. So we have three fantastic speakers. Uh, a couple quick uh, housekeeping uh, uh, items for anybody who has questions throughout the session, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom link. There's both a Q&A feature and a chat feature. So if you can use the Q&A feature, the speakers can either answer the question live in the Q&A section, or we can save it for the end for uh, a moderated session. So the speakers will go for about 15, 20 minutes, and at the end, please stay online with any questions, and we will uh, speak with about them live. So uh, for the first speaker, I have the pleasure of introducing Daniela Jodorkowski at Columbia University. Uh, she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Cognitive Neuroscience at Harvard University, and then went on to do residency at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. This is followed by a gastroenterology fellowship at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Now she serves as the director of gastrointestinal motility and physiology, and as well is a program director of gastroenterology fellowship at the Division of Digestive and Liver Diseases at Columbia University. Her clinical interests include diagnosing and treating gastroesophageal reflux disease, swallowing disorders, achalasia, porous gastroparesis, as well as irritable bowel syndrome, and the entire spectrum of functional GI disorders. Tonight, she's going to be covering an update on pharmacologic therapy for gastroparesis. So please take it away. Thanks so much, Steve, for the nice introdu introduction. And thanks to AFS for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen. OK, so today I'm going to um, talk about gastro uh, pharmacologic therapy for gastroparesis. And I have to admit, I was a little nervous to give this topic because I know that there are some really amazing, innovative things that are gonna be talked about today. And frankly, pharmacologic therapy is a little bit more dry, but obviously it's one of the cornerstones of our therapy for gastroparesis. So I'm gonna give you a, a good update on that today. So you all know that gastroparesis is the syndrome of objective delay in gastric emptying plus symptoms without evidence of mechanical obstruction. But we know that even though that is what defines gastroparesis, the delay does not necessarily translate to the symptom severity. So this is an often quoted slide that plots the percent gastric emptying at uh, two hours on the x-axis and the GCSI, gastroparesis cardinal symptom index on the y. And as you can see, there's really no correlation between the degree of delay and the degree of symptoms. So understanding what else may be causing the symptoms will lead us to find some new targets for medications. So in addition to the end point that we're all familiar with the delayed gastric emptying, there may be uh, problems with defective fundus accommodation, which could lead to early satiety, epigastric pain, fullness, uh, and there could be a gastric dysrhythmia that could lead to nausea, or there, there could be some sensory neuropathy, which could lead to pain, or other kind of uh, central effects like nausea, in addition to this delayed emptying. So this may explain why sometimes prokinetics alone are not always effective for complete management of the symptoms. And this talk could actually be like one minute long because still there's only one FDA approved medication for gastroparesis, which is metoclopramide. Uh, as you all know, it's a dopamine receptor antagonist. It does cross the blood-brain barrier, so CNS side effects are unfortunately common. There's a black box warning due to the very rare risk of tardive dyskinesia, so its limited treatment duration is 12 weeks. More recently approved in uh, June of 2020 was a nasal spray version of metoclopramide, and this is obviously an, an attractive uh, option for someone who's actively uh, vomiting, who can't take PO. And how I kind of break down other possibilities for medications that are off-label would be to divide them into kind of different categories. So we have the prokinetics, the various antiemetics, and the neuromodulators. So I mentioned metoclopramide. Uh, domperidone is a similar mechanism, but has less blood-brain barrier um, penetration, but is unfortunately not FDA approved. And you can get this through an IND. 
erythromycin and azithromycin macrolide antibiotics that have uh, effects on the motilin receptors, but unfortunately can be limited uh, by tachyphylaxis. Uh, you all know the host of antiemetics that are available that again are not necessarily directly impacting the delay in the emptying, but can help with nausea in, in general. And then the neuromodulators, um, usually we would be thinking of these more for the pain part of the gastroparesis. So I'm gonna mention a few uh, medications that I like to use that you may not be as familiar with uh, that are available in, in the US but are off-label. Procalipride, aprepitin, mirtazapine, and buspirone. And then I'm gonna discuss a few medications that are in the pipeline that are under development for gastroparesis that hopefully we will have available in the future. So starting with procalipride, this is FDA approved for chronic constipation. So it's not approved technically for gastroparesis. It's a selective 5-HT4 agonist and has um, no HERG inhibition. So other prior 5-HT4 agonists had risk of cardiac arrhythmia, like cisapride, uh, which was taken off the market. And this does not have that risk. And even though it's, a, it's many studies for constipation and it's approved for constipation, this also has been studied in gastroparesis. So there was an RCT in the red journal of 34 patients that were mostly idiopathic that uh, took procalipride for four weeks. And as you can see on the graph, they had improvement in their GCSI scores, PAGI SIM scores, and gastric emptying via the breath test. Um, but note that the improvement was mostly in the um, nausea vomiting, nausea vomiting, early fullness category, and not necessarily pain reduction. It's pretty well tolerated medication. Um, obviously it's approved for constipation. So diarrhea is a, is a possible side effect, thankfully or not thankfully, but uh, often our, our gastroparesis patients are also constipated. So it may be useful for that. And then another kind of more common side effect I've seen is headache, which tends to go away after continued use. So uh, I have had issues getting this covered if I were to prescribe it for gastroparesis exclusively. And so it is uh, much easier to get it approved when it's for indication of constipation. Aprepitant is an FDA approved uh, medication for the prevention of acute nausea vomiting uh, from chemotherapy or postoperative state. It's a selective neurokinin one antagonist. It has direct antiemetic properties on the brain stem, uh, the emesis center in the brain stem, but it also may have effects on the gastric motor function. So again, going back to our concept that there are other pathophysiologic mechanisms of symptoms other than delayed gastric emptying. So uh, a prepotent may have uh, effect on fundus accommodation. So there was one group who did uh, a control study on, on control, um, not patients, but uh, healthy controls, 24 of them. And they performed gastric emptying test, nutrient satiety drink test, SPECT imaging uh, for gastric accommodation. And they found that a prepotent did not have any effect on the gastric emptying, but it did increase the volume to fullness on a nutrient drink test and the gastric volume on a SPECT. So does at least in control seem to have some effect on uh, fundus accommodation. Then it, it wasn't exclusively studied in gastroparesis patients, but the gastroparesis uh, consortium did an RCT using a prepotent in patients with chronic nausea and vomiting of whom about half of them had a scan that showed delayed emptying. And what they found was that there was improvement in the gastroparesis cardinal symptom index and PAGI SIM subscores, which was nice. But unfortunately, their primary outcome was a visual analog scale for nausea, and there was no uh, difference with a placebo. Uh, they used the visual analog scale because that was the same scale that had been used in the chemotherapy med, uh, trials. This is sometimes uh, difficult to get covered as well. I've tried uh, sometimes the insurances, at least in New York, will give the patient two tablets a month, which obviously for a chronic condition is not that helpful. Um, but we do have it on formulary in our hospital, so it'll, uh, we'll use it often in an inpatient who's admitted with gastroparesis. So mirtazapine, I do use quite frequently as well, off-label. This is an antidepressant that has mixed adrenergic and serotonin activity. So it's a, it has antiemetic properties and it helps people gain weight. Uh, weight gain is actually one of the side effects. 
And uh, there are multiple case reports using mirtazapine and gastroparesis, especially in uh, those who need to gain weight or have nutritional compromise. Uh, Jan Tax group did an RCT of mirtazapine in functional dyspepsia patients and found that it improved symptom scores and nutrient volume tolerance. So this, although this doesn't apply to our, again, our delayed emptying patients, possibly if it's helping with the fundus accommodation can help symptomatically. And there's no RCT for mirtazapine and gastroparesis, but there was an open label study of 30 patients that did find a statistical improvement in nausea, vomiting, and appetite scores, uh, but they did not do physiologic testing. So I will often use this medication, especially if someone has problems with early satiety, poor appetite, and they need to gain weight. And finally, the last medication that we have here uh, that you may not use as much is buspirone. It's a 5-HT1 agonist, which is uh, usually used for anxiety, uh, but um, it also likely has effects on the gastric motor function. So there was an RCT, again, of functional dyspepsia patients of 10 milligrams TID, so AC meal. And what, it, what they found was that it improved fundus accommodation using a barostat, but did not have any effect on empty. But in these patients, it did have they did have decreased symptom scores of postprandial fullness, bloating, and early satiety. Uh, so it may be helpful for a subset of our gastroparesis patients. Note that nausea and vomiting did not, uh, was not significantly reduced, so it may not be as helpful for those patients whose main symptoms are nausea and vomiting. Now I'm gonna shift gears to in the pipeline. So, Although what many of these are, are really trying to enhance gastric emptying, they also might address some of the other pathophysiologic mechanisms that I mentioned. So I'm gonna discuss velucitrag, relomorelin, esotiamide, I'm actually not quite sure how to pronounce that, but I think that's it, and tridipotent. So velucitrag is a selective 5-HT4 agonist, kind of like what procalopride is. It's a once daily oral medication. Recently published was a phase two RCT of 34 patients uh, with gastroparesis, about half of them were diabetic. And what they found was that it improved gastric emptying on a breath test at the highest dose only, the 30 milligrams. Whether this translates to symptom improvement, again, we don't necessarily know and that has not yet been published. Another target I haven't mentioned is ghrelin. So uh, you probably all know that ghrelin is a hormone that's concentrated in the stomach and acts centrally to induce hunger, but it also has function on the gastric motor function. So it increases tone, increases the frequency of antral contractions, accelerates gastric emptying and has no impact on the fundus accommodation. So obviously this is a nice target for gastroparesis. And over the years, there've been several um, phase one and two trials for ghrelin agonists, uh, which unfortunately never uh, came to market. But the most recent one is called relomorelin. It's a synthetic ghrelin agonist that's 100 times more potent than the endogenous ghrelin. It's a sub-Q injection. And this has been studied exclusively in diabetic gastroparesis patients. So like the um, endogenous ghrelin, it also has effect on the gastric motor function. It's been shown to increase antral contraction uh, frequency, accelerate emptying, and has no effect on fundus accommodation. And this um, graph and uh, picture is actually just from a single dose of relomorelin in a patient with diabetic gastroparesis. You can see when that patient had placebo, uh, th this was the uh, amount of retention in the stomach, 57% at four hours. But after a single dose of relomorelin, uh, the emptying was 100% at four hours. And here's just a kind of graph representation of that. Another, uh, in, in, other, in a larger study, uh, there was a 12-week phase 2b study of 393 patients with diabetic gastroparesis. And this was twice daily injections of a variety of doses uh, to look at dose response compared to placebo. And what they found was a 75% reduction in vomiting frequency and reduced composite scores. The kind of strange thing about this study was that the placebo arm also had a very high percent of reduction in vomiting frequency. They had 
So technically there was no statistical difference between the two arms, uh, but there's just something funky about that placebo arm. In terms of safety, uh, overall it's a very safe medication, but it has been shown to increase fasting blood glucose levels. Obviously we are studying this in diabetics, so we need to be careful with that. And the experts uh, recommend doing glucose monitoring in these patients. Asotiamide is a muscarinic antagonist, which enhances acetylcholine release and has some acetylcholinesterase inhibitor properties. So the more acetylcholine around, the more peristalsis may happen. Uh, this has actually only been studied in functional dyspepsia patients, not in gastroparesis patients. But again, we're talking about similar mechanisms that may drive symptoms like fungus accommodation. Uh, this study, I believe, was from Japan they used an ultrasound to measure gastric accommodation and emptying. And after two weeks of use of esotiamide, uh, they found improvement in both. And again, this was only functional dyspepsia patients. And finally, another one on, uh, hopefully on the way is tridipotent. This is an NK1 receptor inhibitor similar to the aprepotent we spoke about earlier. Uh, a four-week randomized control trial of twice-a-day tridipotent versus placebo found that the nausea severity decreased. And this was in 152 patients, a mixture of idiopathic and diabetic gastroparesis. And uh, you can see in the graph, there was a statistical difference between the two arms. And when you took a, a cohort of patients who presented as their main symptom was vomiting, you can see that this effect was even better. It was magnified. Uh, that the nausea would decrease. I didn't show the graphs, but uh, important to note that when they stratified whether the patient was idiopathic or diabetic, that the effect on idiopathic was better. Uh, in diabetic gastroparesis patients who took the tridipotent, they did not have statistical significantly lower nausea scores than placebo. <laughs> However, um, it was likely underpowered. They had fewer diabetic patients. Sorry about my dog barking. So in summary, pharmacologic targets in gastroparesis are usually aimed at accelerating the empty. Uh, other targets that may improve symptoms could include uh, improving gastric accommodation or central or sensory modulation. Right now, metoclopramide is still the only FDA approved medication for gastroparesis, but there are a host of other off-label medications that could be used either as prokinetics or for other symptom management. And finally, the novel therapies in pipeline are in the pipeline uh, address both the prokinetic and alternative pathways. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that talk. Fantastic. It's nice to know there's a bunch of stuff coming down the pipeline because I feel like you know, I'm, a young, I'm a young doctor, but it still feels like throughout my whole training career, a lot of the old school meds were, that's all we had for a really long time. So it's exciting to know what the future holds. So thank you very much for that review. All right, so next up we have uh, Paul Colavita. Paul got his uh, medical degree at the University of North Carolina and did his general surgery at uh, Atrium Health at Carolina's Medical Center. He then went to a very prestigious fellowship in minimally invasive surgery and foregut surgery in Portland, Oregon, where he trained under Lee Swanstrom. Uh, he then returned back to Atrium in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, where he is currently. His uh, academic interests and clinical interests include GI surgery, foregut surgery, and surgical endoscopy. Uh, some notable accomplishments include uh, one of the first physicians in the state of North Carolina to perform the poem procedure. He's received numerous uh, awards from multiple very prestigious societies, uh, even including a Sage's traveling uh, scholarship and grant to go to the world famous ERCAD in France. Uh, he's also uh, done some amazing work at Harvard Medical School where he was accepted to uh, do a surgical leadership program. So Paul's going to be talking to us about gastric simulation and gastric resections as options for uh, therapeutic management of gastroparesis. So Paul, take it away. Steve, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you to the AFS for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to start my slideshow here. All right, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, Again, I'm Paul Colavita from Atrium Health, and I'll be going over surgical options for gastroparesis. 
So surgical management is typically reserved for failure of medical management. Uh, surgical options are going to include gastric stimulator, subtotal gastrectomy, pyloric therapy, whether laparoscopic or endoscopic. Sleeve gastrectomy is a newer uh, reported therapeutic modality. And then finally, feeding gastrostomy, venting gastrostomy uh, can also be used. Uh, the problem when looking at surgical studies regarding gastroparesis is that many of them are imperfect. Uh, often they're single center, small numbers, retrospective. They have mixed etiologies, whether uh, diabetic, idiopathic, iatrogenic. And these studies often involve overlapping therapies. Uh, when you're looking at combined therapies of stimulator, then pyloric therapy, or vice versa, you could potentially only be selecting patients who failed the initial therapy and maybe were uh, inappropriate candidates for pyloric therapy or for uh, stimulator, for example. When I was training uh, at the Oregon Clinic, um, we kind of followed a step-up approach. This was uh, five, six years ago. And we started with the least invasive first. This was pyloric therapy or gastric stimulator. And if these failed, subtotal gastrectomy. Uh, a tailored approach has also been described um, where um, Richardson's group uh, looked at stimulator uh, pyloroplasty or combined. This particular publication from 2018 involved 58 patients, uh, mostly diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis, uh, very few iatrogenic. And um, they report in this table the mean improvement in score uh, uh, with the standard deviation. And uh, stimulators showed improvement in symptom severity across the board, vomiting, nausea, early satiety, bloating, postprandial fullness, epigastric pain, epigastric burning, um, some improvement in the frequency of nausea, vomiting, or satiety, epigastric pain, and epigastric burning. Uh, this was very much supporting gastric stimulator use for these patients. Uh, in contrast, pyloroplasty uh, really showed only improvement in <clears throat> the severity of nausea or vomiting and the frequency of nausea and early satiety. Uh, when looking at the combined therapies uh, to the right, uh, we see general improvement uh, in frequency and severity for most, most categories. Uh, Amber Shade is going to uh, speak next, and she's going to focus on uh, pyloric therapy. I'm only going to briefly touch on that in this presentation. I will tell you she is an expert. Here's a paper she wrote with 177 patients. Uh, the year uh, before I was at the Oregon Clinic, she was there and uh, did this work with that group. Another option for treating gastroparesis uh, surgically is a symptom-based approach. Um, Parkman's group uh, reported the outcomes of 120 patients in the Journal of GI Surgery, and there were a lot of overlapping etiologies and therapies in this paper. Uh, again, primarily diabetic and idiopathic gastroparesis, uh, only six iatrogenic uh, etiologies. Um, a lot of stimulators, 74, 25 with pyloric therapy only, 21 combined. And uh, when they looked at their data, nausea and vomiting symptoms were more likely to get a gastric uh, stimulator, and patients who responded to Botox were more likely to get pyloric therapy. Um, and regardless of this, all three treatment groups improved. There's no difference between stimulators, pyloric therapy, uh, or combined. Um, Again, I think when we start combining therapies, we're just selecting people who, who failed the first treatment, so we added a second one. Um, I don't think we've ever shown uh, additive properties to multiple treatments. And the next question is, uh, as uh, POP and GPOM have gained a lot of traction in recent years, and uh, if you look at surgical gastroparesis literature right now, it's uh, very heavy in endoscopic pyloric therapy. What do you do when the pyloric isn't the problem? Uh, we have minimal evidence that pyloric therapy is going to improve delayed gastric emptying, uh, especially when it's caused by fundic accommodation problems. This data goes back to the, the 1980s. And uh, so what should we do if fundic accommodation is the problem and not the pylorus? What if they have a dysrhythmia? What if the, the antromotility is the issue? Uh, simply opening the pyloric channel uh, may not help these patients and probably uh, is less likely to help them. We need to use uh, tools uh, such as impedance planimetry or endoflip the electrogastrogram and intraduodenal motility to help sort these patients out. And that's where I really think we're gonna start improving our therapeutic gain and improving the uh, ratio of patients who benefit in uh, clinical practice and in the literature is if we can target uh, treatments based on physiology. So I'll touch base briefly on endoflip, um, specifically as it relates uh, to pyloric surgery. And uh, the problem is that normal values aren't clearly defined. 
Uh, some studies describe less than five as being abnormal. Others use 10. Uh, I've seen uh, eight to 10 as a range in uh, recent editorials. Uh, Snape et al. Uh, first examined this and um, showed elevated pyloric pressure in 42% of patients with nausea and vomiting and delayed gastric emptying or essentially gastroparesis. Uh, severe delayed gastric emptying, uh, mean distensibility was eight versus 12.5 in normal patients. Balloon pressure, the surface area, um, and the minimum diameter were also significant in that study. Uh, Malik et al. also examined this. Uh, they found that uh, surface area and minimum diameter were related to early satiety. Uh, and they saw no differences in these uh, measurements between idiopathic and diabetic gastroparesis. Uh, we do know that a low desensibility predicts a response to Botox. This logically makes sense. Um, if the pylorus is the problem, treating the pylorus should help. Interestingly, when we try to apply this to uh, endoscopic pyloric therapy, uh, these authors did find that post myotomy uh, measurement, so once you're done with your myotomy, you do an endoflip measurement, that will correlate with outcomes, but the pre myotomy values did not. So you, you can't really predict in this study who's going to respond to a POP or a GPOM and who isn't. You really only know after you do it. Um, going on with combined therapies. Um, Kevin L. Hayek was a senior author on this paper looking at POP after gastric stimulator. Again, potentially selecting for patients who didn't improve after gastric stimulator. Uh, small study, 22 patients, somewhat incomplete follow-up, 72% uh, of the patients had a 90-day assessment, uh, 14 of the patients, roughly 60% had a repeat gastric emptying study, but they did see some improvements. Um, uh, this was mostly, uh, this was only idiopathic and diabetic gastroparesis as you see in the top right table. Uh, bottom right, uh, we see a dramatic improvement in the uh, gastric emptying studies, 50% retention before POP, 4% uh, retention after. Uh, we also see improvements in the GCSI uh, scores um, really across the board here. So moving beyond the pylorus, what do we do when the pylorus is normal? I think our best options are going to be a gastric stimulator, a subtotal gastrectomy, or a sleeve gastrectomy. We're gonna talk first about the gastric stimulator. Uh, when you're considering gastric stimulators, uh, patient selection is important. Uh, it's really only indicated for diabetic or idiopathic gastroparesis. You certainly need to rule out other diseases like cyclic vomiting syndrome. Uh, the stimulator treats nausea and vomiting uh, probably the best. Uh, uh, these patients are typically who I select for stimulator placement. Certainly need to be refractory or intolerant to medical therapy, candidates for general anesthesia. If they're on narcotics, uh, to try to wean these preoperatively certainly impacts uh, GI motility. Uh, in our current practice, we, we don't offer stimulator patients, uh, stimulators to patients who can't come off narcotics. Also important to note that this has only been evaluated in patients age 18 to 70 and non-pregnant. Certainly stimulators are placed in pediatric patients. Uh, one of my colleagues here at Atrium uh, does this uh, routinely, but only on an IRB, um, which is important to know the, the current indications. Uh, in diabetic patients who are getting a stimulator, still need to work on glucose control. So we all know neuropathies uh, can be reversible in the situation. And finally, uh, this is a, uh, a humanitarian device. It has, has an exemption by the FDA. The effectiveness uh, for its use uh, hasn't uh, truly been demonstrated at the time that it was approved. As far as the technique, uh, typically done laparoscopically, you'll place the, uh, the leads. Optimum placement is felt to be uh, the region of the gastric pacemaker, roughly 10 centimeters proximal to the pylorus. We'll place one lead uh, along the greater curve, uh, trying to get a two centimeter bite of the gastric tissue. And then a, a second lead, uh, one centimeter apart and perfectly parallel to the, the first lead. Uh, you then confirm the uh, impedance um, with the generator and do an endoscopy to confirm that you haven't violated the gastric mucosa. Uh, you would certainly want to replace the leads if that occurs and then uh, implant the generator in the subcutaneous tissue. And uh, also recommend getting an X-ray to document the initial lead position so you can uh, see if things change in the future with a simple X-ray. Uh, looking at the data, 2008, uh, Dan McKenna uh, and John Gold uh, and others published a uh, study of 19 patients. And they did report a reduction in vomiting in 75% of diabetic patients and 100% of idiopathic patients. Uh, looking at their uh, symptom scores, they use the total gastroparesis symptom score, TSS, and 
in the diabetic group, they actually saw improvements uh, at six weeks, six months, and 12 months in the TSS. In the idiopathic group, they didn't see a statistically significant increase at any time point. And in patients with post-surgical gastroparesis, again, iatrogenic, there's only three in the study, uh, they did see statistically significant improvement at uh, six months. Certainly, uh, when you're looking at the idiopathic patients, um, scores are lower at six weeks, six months, 12 months. Uh, it's only six patients, uh, probably underpowered, uh, maybe a beta error in uh, columns two and three in this table. Uh, review on gastric simulators was published in 2015. Uh, briefly summarize it. Uh, they reported a pooled finding of 60 to 70% improvement in symptoms. They found little to no impact on gastric emptying. There were seven studies included that showed improvement in emptying, seven without. I have heard uh, proponents of stimulators uh, describe a 15% improvement, uh, but I, I, I do trust this uh, uh, meta-analysis here. There's a lot of confounding in the study. Uh, there's some, some a lot of continued prokinetics and delayed gastric emptying. There's also some discrepancy in the definition between the various papers. Moving on to sleep gastrectomy. Uh, in my mind, it seemed, seemed a little counterintuitive when I first heard of it. Um, it uh, was actually described in an abstract EAES in 2005 by Fuchs et al. Uh, certainly there uh, are data to uh, support this with uh, fund duplication of fundectomy being demonstrated to improve gastric emptying. Uh, a recent publication, 2019, uh, in surgical, uh, sorry, Langebeck's Archives of Surgery, uh, Santiago Horgan's group uh, reported outcomes of 19 cases. And uh, essentially showed uh, preoperative and postoperative symptoms in, in the table selected here and showed improvement in heartburn, regurgitation, and retrosternal pain uh, at beyond 12 months postoperatively, as well as uh, improvement in uh, kind of your classic gastroparesis symptoms, epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, belching, flatulence, fullness, bloating. Uh, sleep gastrectomy uh, showed a lot of promise with this early paper. Uh, they also looked at a barium sandwich uh, gastric emptying study. I'm not terribly familiar with this protocol, but it did show uh, improvement in emptying. And the GI quality of life uh, graph here on the right uh, also shows improvements uh, post-op compared to pre-op. And uh, post-op findings were similar to control uh, patients. Uh, hot off the press, uh, 2021, uh, August, um, we have a study of uh, 10 patients with sleep gastrectomy for gastroparesis. Again, mixed etiologies, mostly idiopathic, diabetic, one uh, neurologic with Parkinson's. Eight of these had failed a uh, stimulator uh, treatment. Uh, again, decent follow-up of 13.3 months, and they reported significant improvement in the GCSI scores from 33.6 before sleeve to 14.9 after. Um, we need more data on sleep gastrectomies for gastroparesis. I suspect more being done in practice than are currently in the literature. And I think this should be one of the aims of uh, AFS going forward, and I'll touch on that a little bit more momentarily. We'll jump to subtotal gastrectomy. Uh, this is a paper out of the Oregon Clinic, uh, 2014, presented at the SSAT, published in 2015. And as I mentioned before, uh, at the Oregon Clinic, we followed a step-up approach, start with a stimulator or pyloric therapy, and uh, for better of those, we move on to a uh, gastrectomy, you know, truly removing the dysfunctional uh, and organ. Uh, I like the title of this paper, End of the Road. Uh, they included 35 patients, a decent mix of etiologies, 43% postoperative, 34% diabetic, 23% idiopathic. And a number of them had had previous procedures. Uh, you see on the right, 46% uh, had a prior pyloroplasty, 23% had a prior stimulator. Again, going with that step up approach. And um, as far as the perioperative outcomes, uh, most of the patients had a gastrojejunostomy. Uh, six of them, or 17%, had an esophagojejunostomy. Uh, there were some major morbidities. Uh, they had a leak in three patients uh, at the uh, esophago or gastrojejunal uh, anastomosis, duodenal stump leak in two, and a jejunojejunostomy leak in one. Six of the patients, uh, or 17%, required reoperation. Uh, minor morbidities such as wound infection, hematoma uh, were noted, and the length of stay was roughly 4.5 days. Um, it's important to highlight here is, uh, you know, this is not without risk. Sure, it's a, a laparoscopic minimally invasive procedure, uh, but um, leaks and um, other morbidities uh, do occur, and uh, these patients may still need reoperation. Um, however, 
despite these morbidities, patients do improve. If we uh, look at table three on the left here, there was no improvement in uh, abdominal pain median score um, from preoperative to postoperative, but the score was relatively low uh, preoperatively. Uh, nausea uh, improved significantly, belching and bloating improved significantly after uh, gastrectomy. To further break down these symptoms on the right, uh, we first look at abdominal pain. Uh, this is stratified by the frequency of uh, preoperative symptoms uh, on the y-axis. So patients who had at least daily abdominal pain, 38% uh, resolved after surgery, 50% improved. Similarly for patients who had weekly abdominal pain before surgery, uh, the majority resolved, 25% uh, improved. And uh, for any abdominal pain, again, 50% resolving uh, and improving. Um, however, the, again, look at the table on the left, the median pain, abdominal pain score did not change. Uh, similar trends with nausea, as you can see, with a majority of patients having resolution or improvement of their nausea after their subtotal gastrectomy. So the next question is, when you're doing a subtotal gastrectomy, should you remove the remnant? Uh, presented at Sages 2019, published in 2020. Uh, we have here 53 patients with a almost perfect uh, distribution. 26 had the gastric remnant left in place. 27 had the gastric remnant removed. And when you look at the quality of life scores, uh, they were essentially the same. Uh, when you look at outcomes, uh, as far as complications, the patients who had the remnant removed had more, more, more morbidity, uh, but they were less likely to need further intervention. Uh, I clearly uh, imperfected the timing of the, the boxes being delivered there with the animation. Uh, but when we, when we look at uh, related surgical intervention, uh, the patients who had the remnant left in place, 23% uh, uh, required further intervention, or 23%, uh, six of them. Uh, most of these were feeding tubes, uh, four patients, or 15%. Uh, only one patient needed further uh, intervention after a gastrectomy with the remnant removed and that was for an intestinal transplant. Um, I, I still, I don't think we have a clear answer of what's best here. Uh, certainly uh, quality of life is the same, uh, but needing further procedures, uh, there's downside to leaving the remnant, but uh, lower short-term uh, morbidity is also important. In conclusion, there's no magic bullet for gastroparesis. Surgery is reserved for failure of medical management. Not all procedures are successful in all gastroparesis. Etiology matters. The motility of the pylorus, the antrum, and the fundus probably matter more than the etiology itself. Uh, impedance planimetry uh, may help us determine who's going to benefit from pyloric therapy. And uh, just to go over my current algorithm, certainly these patients need to fail medical management. If a patient presents with primarily nausea, especially if they have a diabetic etiology or idiopathic uh, stimulator up front, uh, is a very reasonable move. For a patient with a primary primarily pyloric issue or an iatrogenic etiology, uh, pyloric surgery. So if a patient had a fund duplication and, and we think both vagus nerves were cut, they have new onset gastroparesis, uh, I will just, just go treat the pylorus. If pyloric surgery fails um, or stimulator fails and there's a fundic issue, uh, current practice would be a subtotal gastrectomy. Um, I typically do leave the remnant in my current practice. Um, considering sleeve, I, I don't do bariatrics. I'd probably uh, recruit some of my bariatric partners in this endeavor, but I'm waiting for more data. Patients who have a significant recurrent hiatal hernia, failed fund implication, and gastroparesis, uh, my go-to is uh, a ruin Y with the remnant retained. Uh, in, in this reoperative field, I, I don't feel comfortable um, uh, with a duodenal stump. Um, usually these are very uh, involved uh, surgeries to deconstruct everything. On occasion, if a patient has a very small recurrent hernia and the main issue appears to be gastric emptying, I will do pyloric surgery only and uh, monitor their symptoms. They may need future revision, uh, but it feels uh, to carry a lot less risk to treat the pylorus only, especially endoscopically uh, in a, the setting of a recurrent hiatal hernia. Uh, what we really need to do to treat these patients in the future is we need to pool data in the AFS. We need multi-center retrospective data collection we can figure out um, retrospectively what the best outcomes appear to be for etiologies and physiology. We can standardize the workup. And uh, then we can design multi-center prospective studies through AFS, stratifying patients by physiology and or etiology to truly find the best algorithms for treating uh, this uh, difficult patient population. Thank you very much.
All right, Paul, thanks so much. That was an awesome talk. Really, there are a lot of options on the table and all the way through uh, different gastrectomy options. So thank you for covering all that. I definitely would highlight your last point that you make. We definitely need multi-center multi -center studies. A lot of these studies are single institution, low numbers, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of poor gut surgeons and endoscopists and gastroenterologists who are treating these patients. And I agree, pooled data is definitely the way to go as we uh, have more and more options for larger studies. So great talk, thanks so much. Um, next up, we have Amber Sheda speaking. She's at the University of Wisconsin, where she initially got her MD. Uh, then she moved on to a research fellowship uh, doing human immune therapy at the University of Virginia, followed by her general surgery residency. She also did the same uh, very, very prestigious fellowship with Lee Swanstrom in Portland, Oregon, minimal invasive surgery, for gut, and endoscopic surgery. Uh, she's returned to the University of Wisconsin, where she's the assistant professor in the Division of Minimally Invasive Surgery, where she specializes in esophageal and gastric disorders, advanced endoscopic surgery and procedures, uh, and as well has research interests in endoscopic device development, clinical trials in foregut disease and general surgery, as well as clinical outcomes. So she's going to be hitting on one of these new hot topics, which is uh, pearl, pyloromyotomy, gastroparesis, POP, or G-POEM. So Amber, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Steve, thanks for having me and uh, appreciate the American Forget Society for the invite to talk. Um, so I'm just gonna go through uh, a few things today. I'm gonna talk about when you would and would not use a POP um, for treatment of gastroparesis, just a run through of briefly the technique and then some of the outcomes data we have and then my own treatment algorithm, which is complicated. So the indications for me are um, patients with primary gastroparesis that can typically be either diabetic or idiopathic. Um, and idiopathic, there's a gamut of things that you see alongside patients with gastroparesis. And then um, the vast majority of my patients with gastroparesis have post-op gastroparesis. They've had prior foregut surgery and their stomach doesn't empty as a result, or they have an esophagectomy and their conduit doesn't empty. So my workup is pretty simple. I ask that they have an endoscopy just to evaluate the pylorus itself and make sure it is a structural uh, or not a structural problem. If you have a, a stenosis that I would treat a little bit differently, I wouldn't jump right to pyloromyotomy. And then I asked for an emptying study. Four hour emptying is sort of my gold standard. I like to have um, greater than 10% retained on a four hour solid study. A two hour study to me is okay, not as good. The four hours, the gold standard, um, but I accept that in some circumstances. And then if I scope a patient and they're more than six months out from their foregut operation, and this is what their stomach looks like here on the right, that's proof enough for me if they're, on a, if they're fasted that we have a problem and we probably can move right to uh, surgical treatment after we've tried out medical, obviously, and dietary therapy. The patients that make me think twice, patients who are on motility altering meds like opioids, um, it's not an absolute contraindication in my practice, but it is something that I talk with the patient about, can we adjust your medications to make your life better instead? And then patients whose entire gut doesn't work top to bottom, um, I just don't think any surgical treatment short of a J-tube um, for support, maybe a G-tube for decompression, will help patients like that. They're a really unfortunate uh, part of my practice and they don't get POPs. So this is uh, a compilation I put together on pyloromotomy. I do an anterior approach. Um, I come as between the incisura and the pylorus and I do a lift with methylene blue and saline of about 15 ml. I used to use epinephrine in my lift. I don't anymore. Um, just simply saline and methylene blue. Um, I use a knife device. I use the triangle tip knife and make a horizontal um, mucosotomy. Use an endocut setting for mucosotomy. And you can see my dissecting cap that I have on here now. I use that um, in a bit. I'll, it becomes obvious for getting into that tunnel traction, counter traction. Um, I found that a generous mucosotomy is super helpful, so I try not to be too stingy. Um, then I paint through the submucosa with my knife to expose the muscle underneath. This white, um, 
nice bright white is the muscle. The blue is just um, the submucosal space with the methylene blue saline solution. They use the cap to kind of lever down on the mucosa inferiorly here. Now I've used that cap and I'm just showing off some mucosal vessels that can come from the muscle and come out to the mucosa. Those can cause a little bit of bleeding. It's nothing, um, you know, it's nothing terrible and life-threatening, but it can be very annoying when you're trying to see. Um, I like John Rodriguez described the pylorus as a sort of calamari ring and you can see it coming into view here. It's this white horizontal band and I'm just working under the, um, in the submucosal space underneath that pylorus to try to see the distal aspect of it. And then I do my myotomy distal to proximal. I just paint, I paint as distal as I can and then I roll um, my scope up and I keep moving proximal, taking muscle as I go. And the reason I do that is because the serosa as well as the submucosa stay in this beautiful blue and the muscle stays white. And then if you follow the blue interface down at the bottom and just keep it in your view, you keep you sort of rolling back to where your, the pylorus ends. So you kind of know that you're not being incomplete with your myotomy. So you can see the beautiful blue of the back of mucosa as well as the vessels down there. For this, I use a coag setting. I used to use a spray coag and lately I've been using more forced coag. It's a little bit better for energy, um, less energy uh, spread. So you can see I'm starting to get to the point where the amount of submucosa I see down there, the blue is getting more prominent. And I always wonder how proximal to go. It always feels like maybe I don't do enough, but um, I think the pylorus does kind of roll away from you as you go. And as long as you have a, a cap full of non-pylorus by the end, to me, that feels sufficient. Done a few where I use endo flip to guide and I, I feel good about the way the endo flip looks pre and post here. Here I'm bouncing all the way through. You can see that I've made it through the muscle there. And then I'm gonna get the last little band of muscle down here and you can see the beautiful serosa down behind. And then after I'm happy with my myotomy, I'll do an endo flip and then I'll go ahead and close the mucosotomy with clips. So trickier than an esophageal poem just because you're in a wider space and you need to be a little more patient getting a full bite with the clips, but you need fewer, typically two or three clips is enough to get this uh, closed. And remember it's not, um, it's not a full thickness uh, operation unlike a poem, so you're not um, necessarily at risk of uh, leak if the clips fail. So I do these as outpatient. I put the patient on puree for two weeks. They are given antiemetics and um, a PPI and caraphate and sent home and they do very well. I think the purees are best for patients with gastroparesis anyway. So most of them feel good on a liquid diet and then they advance uh, after that two week mark. So here's um, some data, not my own, but mine has fallen quite similar to this. This is a series out of the Cleveland Clinic looking at 100 patients um, after POP. And the GCSI scores uh, improved significantly, 3.8 to 2.5. And so 3.8 is like a severe to very severe uh, symptom score of nausea, vomiting, bloating. 2.5 is mild to moderate. So in my book, that is a win for these patients. And then 78% of them have improved emptying. I think somewhere around 50% of them normalize completely. And here's a shorter series, but with a longer follow-up. So eight, thir only 30 patients, but they followed for 18 months. They found the same, 78% had improved emptying. And even cooler, so they had GCSI scores out to 18 months, and you can see that those scores persistently were better for overall GCSI, for nausea, vomiting, for early satiety, and then for bloating as well. And very excitingly, over here on the left, they found that after POP, or G-POEM, that the number of ER visits and the number of hospitalizations went down in these patients as compared to a baseline control group that didn't get surgery. For anyone who takes care of these patients, they frequent the ER and it is very time consuming and they use a lot of healthcare. So anything that can keep them out of the ER and out of the hospital is a win in my book. Um, so this is just a meta-analysis looking at 10 studies. It was published last year, 281 patients, you know, at least uh, 130 of which we just talked about, right? And uh, they found that overall GCSI improved across every study, um, that gastric emptying improved across every study, um, and 
this is kind of what I quote for my patients too, the complications that they see are, are two major classes, right? GI bleed and uh, pneumoperitoneum or leak afterward. Abdominal pain, yes, is a complication, but those two are, you know, the big ones. And just like Paul, I think the use of endoflip is very intriguing after um, pop. I use it uh, routinely and I um, just let this study that of Mike Ujiki's uh, group that looked at about 34 patients and um, looked at pre and post pop flip data and found that patients whose symptoms resolved had a significantly higher pressures and then lower distensibility. So maybe counter to what um, other data suggests like uh, Mo and Kassab's group, maybe we have um, some preliminary data saying that distensibility of the pylorus as measured by endofoot could predict um, response to POP. So maybe we could reserve it for those who would preferentially benefit. I think that work is uh, future coming and exciting. So my own algorithm is very messy. So when patients come in with gastric emptying, proven gastroparesis, we talk about have they tried diet? Have they tried medications? Are they nutritionally appropriate, right? Do they need a feeding tube? Yes, no, that's all a separate decision. And then for those with vagal nerve injury, they get a pyloric procedure up front. Everyone else has their choice of stimulator or pyloric procedure, and they can talk me into both, but I try not to do both. And then if they have a pyloric procedure, we repeat emptying. If they have a stimulator, we do not. We just go by GCSI. And if we're not um, hit success, I usually flip them into the other group and they get the opposite, except the uh, vagal nerve injury group, if they're persistently delayed, we talk about whether to do another pyloric procedure or whether to go straight to gastric resection. So just to sum up, we talked about, you know, when we do this, how we do it, how it works, and then um, how you might use it in your practice. So that's all I've got. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, Amber. That was an awesome talk about a really new and exciting technique that I think has generated a lot of interest, as Paul alluded to. So go through a couple questions. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, going back to the medical management question for Daniela. So um, at least in my own practice, I've seen, you know, you talk about some really nice new uh, down the line medications, which is hopefully offer much more benefit than what we already have. Uh, one, only one, I guess, being FDA approved. But I have seen a handful of patients in my practice who you know, as we know, these patients are difficult. They're on multiple medications for other things. And you go to write that prescription for, for Reglan or metoclopramide, and you have these, boom, serious interactions with whatever else they're taking. Um, you know, when you see patients who either don't tolerate uh, Reglan or erythromycin, or they have serious drug interactions with other uh, medications, and you can't get them on these new um, off-label uses or upcoming medications, do you have kind of a, an approach to these, these situations? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it really depends on what the presenting symptom is, honestly, because I think if they have vomiting, then it makes sense that a prokinetic would be important to find. And I do use procalipride quite often. I have a lot of patients who have constipation as well. So, um, you know, I cheat a little bit because they, they tend to say they have constipation. So then I can justify prescribing it. Um, if their symptom is really more kind of early satiety and fullness, epigastric fullness, um, and not so much vomiting, then I kind of go more the neuromodulator route, something like mirtazapine. Um, I also work very closely with my nutritionist, of course. I do think that with time, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a medical doctor, I give pills all the time, but I think with time I've realized really the importance of dietary management for gastroparesis, especially in those maybe more milder cases in terms of not like this huge atonic stomach. So I do often uh, really try to set them up with my nutritionist to go over their diet a little bit better. Awesome. And I think, you know, you mentioned you're talking about Boostpar or Boostpirone kind of in the future. We see a lot of overlap where we're starting to see a lot of these, I guess, central, central nervous system slash, I guess, psych meds is the best description of medications really offering some benefit in the foregut or GI tract. Um, are there any kind of studies and you know, obviously it's a pipeline type of medication, but kind of long-term effects in patients where they may offer some benefit to the gastroparesis or a GI functional standpoint, but more long-term difficulties from a central nervous system or other side effects or, or kind of other medications where they're really coming from a whole other class um, and, you know, major benefit for gastroparesis, but maybe really hitting hard on side effects from another standpoint. Yeah. I mean, I think not, not 
great data about long-term effects of these neuromodulators on gastroparesis patients. Obviously, Reglan, we know the long-term risk about part of dyskinesia. Um, I think that the main ones, the main issues tend to, as you said, tend to be the interactions more than the just length of time that they're on the meds. And a lot of patients are already on psychiatric medication, so then it gets tricky trying to add things. And I kind of joke to my fellows that I speak with other psychiatrists more than I speak with other medical doctors to kind of go over our mutual patients to see what's safe to add, what's not safe. I think the only one that I would be worried about for gastroparesis specifically long-term is high dose of tricyclic antidepressants because they have anticholinergic activity, so they slow down the, the stomach even if they're helping with something like pain. Um, but the other kind of antidepressants, I haven't seen anything about long-term risk. Yeah, and you showed um, the data on, like you said, I'm probably going to butcher the name, uh, Relamorelin. Um, it took a single dose took from 57% emptying to 100% emptying. It almost looks like a magical magic bullet, but you do think it being in the class that it is as a, as a Grelin medication that it may in the future potentially only be indicated for um, diabetic gastroparesis or maybe in the future yeah, it's mean, opened up? Well, so far it's only been studied in diabetics, so that's probably going to be the first label if it's approved. I have to say, though, I was a fellow how many years ago, over 10 years ago, and I gave a talk on gastroparesis and I was presenting things about a ghrelin agonist and it never came to, to the market. So I hope that this is a little bit more promising uh, because definitely the that single dose was, uh, it was a, a sub-Q injection was pretty promising. Yeah, I think, you know, single dose and that's, that type of an effect is pretty impressive. So I guess the future will, will show hopefully a um, couple of other therapeutic questions outside of uh, medication. A question for Paul. Uh, with regard, you were talking a little bit about um, fundus accommodation or determining that, um, you know, is the etiology of a fundic accommodation issue rather than a pyloric issue? You know, for the, the typical community, either community surgeon, community gastroenterologist, obviously there's lots of great technology out there with flip and whatnot, but, you know, typical community doc, um, any any advice in diag you know diagnostics of sorting out pyloric issue versus fundic accommodation issue? Some of you may not have flip technology, really kind of parsing that out. Yeah, great question. Um, I think that the flip technology is uh, probably the best for evaluating the pylorus itself. Uh, Amber made a great point at the beginning of her talk where she does a scope and makes sure there's not a mechanical obstruction, you know, a, sten a true stenosis, um, and uh, you know, you can, you can feel tension on the pylorus when you do an endoscopy. You can tell if the, the tone is increased or not. Um, you know, if, if the pylorus is tight, uh, it could be a poor man's surrogate for a flip. Uh, but when the pylorus is wide open and they have delayed gastric emptying, uh, that's when I'm going to uh, think about an electrogastrogram. Uh, we're close to Wake Forest and actually have a partnership with them. Um, and I just sent somebody yesterday to Wake Forest for an EGG to uh, try to sort this out. Um, I, um, I don't think just empiric Botox is our right answer in that situation. Um, in the published randomized studies, Botox for sham, you know, it's 50, 50 for the Botox to, to get benefit. Um, uh, so if you don't have flip, uh, I think you can give it the eyeball test. And if it looks tight, I might Botox it. Um, but sending, sending it somewhere to a, uh, center, an academic center uh, or private center that has a strong motility program can do an EGG. If you can find someone who will do an antro, do a denal manometry. Those are all things that can help. Yeah, I got to say, I'm a little naive with the EGG studies. So I, I don't know what kind of the prevalence of that uh, diagnostic is across across the centers. Certainly, I'm sure it's more of ac academic centers, but uh, fair point. I like the poor man's test. I, I guess I'm living that world right now. Um, so, you know, we t you talked a little bit about gastric resection options, whether it's sleeve or uh, subtotal, total gastrectomy. Um, you know, I know like you, again, alluded to this point at the end of your talk, we don't have a lot of multi-center studies, but kind of do you either have a sense from the literature or the sense anecdotally or in your own kind of mindset, uh, if you were to compare gastric resection options, um, if one tend to be more um, advantageous, and I'll give you a little bit of my perspective is um, I do all the bariatric, pre-bariatric surgery workup on, on the patients in my program. So I see patients who have really, maybe because they're asymptomatic, honestly, and then I do the pre-op endoscopy and you throw the scope in and it's a big, big, huge stomach full of food. 
Uh, and then you do a gastric emptying study and they're positive. So, you know, part of the guidance I do for my bariatric surgeons is, you know, with this gastroparesis, newly discovered gastroparesis, are they a better sleeve candidate? Are they a better uh, ruin Y gastric bypass candidate? Do you kind of have a, a feeling of kind of gastric resection options as compared, as compared to one another? Um, great question. Uh, so in, I would say a year ago, I would have told you delayed emptying, just do a ruin Y do a gastric bypass. Um, I think it, it, it basically, you know, excludes the diseased organ, right? Your, your elementary limb is not gonna involve a fundic problem, a pyloric problem, an angel problem, you're bypassing all of it. And I still think it's a pretty definitive answer. Um, uh, there are, uh, you know, complications associated with it, obviously, but if you're leaving the remnant in place, uh, I think it's, uh, especially in the bariatric center of excellence, probably low risk. The sleeve data intrigues me, um, I would hesitate to recommend that for delayed gastric emptying right now. Uh, we don't have any really long-term data. You know, what happens if, uh, you know, when the, if the sleeve balloons out and you know, becomes wider with time, do we lose that, that benefit? Um, I think there's a lot of unknowns with sleeves for gastroparesis right now. Uh, we need more data and we need long-term data before I could, uh, before I would personally recommend it to somebody. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it definitely goes back to that same point. I think, you know, big institutions really should, um, look at uh, compiling data. I think it's kind of the next steps for gastroparesis. Um, uh, Amber, you had mentioned uh, kind of your workup for patients and you said like almost a nonstop exclusion criteria for your patients with total gut mo uh, dysmotility. You know, we, we often see these patients and they have the, the classic gastroparesis symptoms, but then you let them talk a little bit more and they talk about whatever constipation issues or other uh, hindgut or midgut issues. Do you, do you formally study, you know, do any sort of objective testing to see if there are total gut issues such as pill cam, total transit time, or is it once they start talking about their colon, you're like, right, it's subjective, you're done. Yeah, that's probably a good thing to clarify. So for someone who, you know, has constipation as part of it, I'll do a SITS marker study. That's not the patient that I'm going to deny a pop to because of their constipation, right? I'm thinking of the patient who really, you can tell that they're gut doesn't understand whether to move things through too fast or too slow. They'll have undigested food one day and then the next day they're completely bloated and nothing goes through. They're just very confusing as to why, why that's happening. So um, it's kind of a the two different kind of patients. The ones who just have some constipation, as long as they don't have a profoundly delayed SITS marker, a pop's not going to hurt them, right? It just might not fix their whole gut. For someone whose small gut is you know, not working that is bound for TPN. That's sort of the patient that I'm thinking of. And maybe Daniela sees some of those um, and understands. They're just someone that it doesn't matter what surgery you do, they're, the change in their uh, symptoms is not going to make their life, quality of life better after pop. Yeah, I see yes. Daniela shaking her head. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of patients with systemic illness like scleroderma, who obviously, who can have pan GI dysmotility. And I think isolated treatment of the gastroparesis may not necessarily help their other um, symptoms. I will say I do have a patient with um, pan GI dysmotility documented severe with Ehlers-Danlos, a connective tissue disease. And she's on TPN and the whole gamut. She's failed everything. She ended up getting a sleeve and it's made her quality of life so much better she always had this big atonic stomach full of food um, that she would, um, you know, the little amount of food she would eat would stay there for days and days. So she had reduced vomiting with the sleeve, um, although her other symptoms were obviously still there. So it did help with her quality of life, but that's a rare patient, I think. Well, we gotta make sure she's the N of one for Paul's next study, that's for sure. There we go. All right, cool. Yeah. So Amber, you'd mentioned um, restudying your patients after your intervention, repeat into, uh, repeat flip technology, for example. Uh, I'm just curious, kind of, is there a point where you get so comfortable and confident with your endoscopic, uh, your GPOP, GPOM, where you may not need, you may not feel inclined to do repeat uh, of flip versus just seeing them in clinic and repeating their symptom severity scores or whichever um, uh, symptom survey you prefer? That's a good question. So. Um, I just do the end of flip right now, immediately prior and immediately post. I'm not taking them back separate um, to do the flip down the road. Um, gastric emptying study, you know, 
for my own data and my, my own QI, I like to have that post. But I will say that for the patient who gets a, feels amazing after their pop and then gets a study where it's not normal, like it's a better but not normal, those patients are really hard to manage because all of a sudden they feel like they haven't had a success <laughs> when they have. So, um, but I still do the emptying because I think it's important to know it's still too early with the pop to just sort of give up and go on symptoms alone. It's, we need the data. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Um, definitely they can be challenging patients and you might, uh, you know, be kicking yourself if you have a great outcome and you do a survey and like subjectively they feel better and then you can repeat their study and they just hang on to that data. So it's an interesting point that you bring up. So a couple quick questions that I just kind of throw up to the whole group. Um, so I think Paul may have alluded to this a little bit, um, you know, we algorithm, medication, surgery, pyloric intervention, where do just plain old feeding tubes feed out in everybody's, uh, oh, feed, that was a pun, uh, put out in everybody's algorithm, just patients where it's just like, you just need to cool off of the feeding tube at GJ for a little bit before, before next steps, or this is the thing for you for now. Anybody want to kind of tackle just pure old feeding tubes as a little bit of an option? temporizing or what have you, destination therapy? I think a patient who has a uh, subtotal gastrectomy and you know still uh, is either not having malnutrition, still having symptoms, can't eat, uh, that's an easy uh, J-tube. Um, if you leave the remnant in place, you can do a G-tube into the remnant. I, I like that uh, a little bit better, obviously less nuisance with leakage and you can bolus feed, et cetera. Uh, that's an easy one, that's an easy, it's time for a tube. Um, yeah, frontline therapy, I don't do it a whole lot, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I would rather treat the pylorus um, if that's the problem than give them a venting tube. I think somebody with fundic accommodation issues, maybe who's not an ideal surgical candidate, it's malnourished, they could get a G and a J or a GJ combined for distal feeding and venting. Um, if I'm trying to fine tune them for surgery, that'd be another uh, time where I would use it. And then my decision on feeding tube is mostly nutrition based. So if someone is nutritionally in need of that supplemental feeding, then that's the right answer. I just did an Intera in a feeding tube on someone who came in and could not stay out of the hospital. She just kept coming in in DKA, nausea, vomiting, you know, and that's the person who needs a feeding tube to get her stabilized and hope the Intera works and then maybe doesn't need it long term, but in the short term certainly does, for example. So same session for both? Okay, great. Um, so last question kind of goes back to the whole theme of these can be very challenging patients is, you know, oftentimes when people, let's just say they're coming to you the first time ever, nothing's been worked up yet. Sounds like classic gastroparesis, but they have some nice little cocktail of things that are going into their system that may throw off your gastric emptying study. So whether they're uh, smoking marijuana, you, you know, THC use, heavy alcohol use, whatever, benzodiazepines, opiates, kind of to each panelist, is there certain medications where it's like, you need to come off this before I even start studying you or start offering you therapy, um, or I'll do your gastric emptying study on this, but I won't offer you a therapy. You know, is it just the opiates? Is it opiates plus alcohol, THC, what have you? Because, you know, I see a fair amount of patients that are, they're on all of them, they're on benzos, they're smoking THC, um, and they're on opiates. So kind of what's everybody's hard yes, hard no, kind of maybe with regards to diagnostic and therapeutic. Uh, opiates are my hard no for even starting the whole workup just because I tell them it's going to be delayed. You're on opiates. That doesn't really help us manage you. You have to stop the opiates. Uh, benzos, I don't feel have as strong of an effect on the motor function of the stomach. And THC, yes, for sure slows down the stomach. If they don't smoke it very, very often, hopefully they could hold it for several days prior to the scan. But um, obviously, if they're chronic smokers, then that can kind of linger in their body for a long time. Um, but opiates, if they're unable to stop them, and especially if they're on high doses, I just don't really find doing a gastric emptying test going to be that helpful. Yeah, I, opiates are, are hard. Um, I've... Uh struggle with the workup. We try to get them to hold it for the test. It's a challenge. Um, it's rare that I will offer surgery to them. I have one patient in mind in particular who uh, has terrible scoliosis and, and dozen back surgeries on chronic narcotics, um, 
you know, sustained release, immediate release. And she also, somebody did a parasophageal hernia repair on her elsewhere. Then they found the gastroparesis and we were kind of in this place where she couldn't eat. The wrap was not well done. We had to operate on her. We converted her to a ruin Y and she hasn't really thrived since then. She's still kind of struggling and she's, she's on the, the train to getting a, a G tube. Um, the THC I think is a, a challenge too, because you can have the cannabinoid hyperemesis. I try to get them to at least stop for, I, I she made up, make up a month and say stop for a month and let's see if anything gets better. Uh, they don't always do that. They could lie about it, I suppose. Um, I haven't gotten to urine testing for that yet. Um, but uh, those are two that uh, are always in my mind when people are using them. Amber, you kind of echo everyone else's thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated, right? Why are they on yeah. them? For how long, for what and for how long? And can they come off? Yes, no, it's all, it's, it depends. Yeah, challenging patients, so. Yeah, no, I think that kind of goes back to the theme. I, you know, I appreciate everybody's uh, time tonight. This is a challenging patient population, uh, challenging disease. I think there's a lot of uh, stuff, hopefully, in the forefront from medications, as uh, Danielle alluded to, pyloric intervention. Uh, maybe the gastrectomy data is going to show some promise in the future. Um, you know, certainly everybody here uh, at academic institutions, hopefully we can all get together and use the venues such as American Fork at Society collaborate between surgery groups, GI groups, different institutions, pool our data, uh, and try to get our patients the best care. So thank you to all three of our speakers for this evening for your time, fantastic talks. Um, just a quick um, highlights for the rest of the year. Uh, the next big topic for American Foregut Society is gonna be Barrett's esophagus and early esophageal cancer. Same as our last two uh, topics, we'll have a separate webinar on the diagnostic aspect of things, uh, and then a separate topic on the therapeutics. So we hope you guys uh, all join us in the future. Again, thank you one last time to our awesome three panelists. Hope everyone has a great night. So thank you very much. Bye. Thanks for hosting, Steve. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a great night.